Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Harry and Megan uh, just had a baby that they named Lily, and supposedly that was after the Queen, but you know, we all know which Lily they really named her after. We're on location today uh, in the lab of Mary Estes and Sarah Blip, the and it's the new organoid lab, otherwise known as the home of the organoid whisperer. More to come on that. So listen, we have real life problems to talk about. Uh, I don't know if you were watching TV this weekend, but uh, John Rahm was leading the Memorial Tournament in, turn in, in, in Ohio by six strokes. Third round, gets tested on random surveillance and he's positive, gets sent home, and you all know, everybody knew he was gonna win the tournament. So it only cost him, you know, $1.7 million or so. The thing about it was that uh, he's from Arizona and Arizona had uh, accepted all people to be vaccinated on March 24th and John Rahm did not run home to get vaccinated and he waited and waited until it was convenient. He was not fully vaccinated and they would never have found it out if it wasn't for the surveillance program. So he was asymptomatic, obviously maybe it's good for his game. Maybe from now on I don't need to be infected to win, but he was doing very, very well. Uh, and asymptomatic, they, they got this positive test. And, and as a result, he was sent, sent home. Kind of like the New York Yankees. One person was infected and infected eight other uh, members of the staff. We would never have known had it not been for the fact that they were on a surveillance program. So one of the big questions that remains, we still don't know the answer to is, if someone's been, uh, had the disease before or someone's been vaccinated, they probably uh, have very low levels of virus. They're asymptomatic, so they're not coughing or sneezing. We do not know if they can transmit virus to other people, but since we don't know, uh, under abundance of caution, people get isolated. So that's really unfortunate. Uh, I can only say we're lucky that the brood 10 emerging cicadas I hear do not carry SARS. So thank God for that, or Ohio and Maryland would be a mess. So let's talk about the world. Uh, nothing's really changed. South America is still really on fire. That's where most of the really hot spots are. India is coming down a bit. There's one really concerning thing going on in the world, and that's the UK. So if you look at the UK numbers, and the UK has had a little uptick uh, that we really don't quite understand, but it seems to be mostly due to the Delta virus, which as you recall, is the variant in India. So we're a little concerned. Everyone's looking at that to see if it's gonna be a major problem. The concern, of course, is that as people's immunity wane, we all think the vaccines and having uh, been infected before protects you against these variants, but as your antibodies wane, is it possible that these variants will take over? And so that will require then booster shots and other discussion about what to do. So that's, a, that's something concerning we have to wait for. Now, what about in the U.S.? Things are very good. Uh, it, it looks very encouraging. For the first time, we had uh, less than 22,000 uh, cases per day on average since June of 2020. So that's really, really great. New England is doing great. Almost all the states in New England had at least a 60% drop. And almost half of the uh, people in the United States had participated in vaccination. They had at least one dose and 40% have had two doses. And if you look at the, the, the United States curve, it's clearly, it's clearly falling. And frankly, I think that means we really kind of have reached herd immunity because the fact of the matter is we are at pre-COVID uh, mobility. Everyone's flying around, people are taking masks off, and yet the numbers continue to improve. That would suggest that the virus is having more and more difficulty in finding uh, a, a previously uninfected host. There are still some hotspots, mostly in the middle of the country, which is a concern. Uh, but you can see most of the most of the country is doing much better. But those, except with a few communities, <laughs> we'll talk about one of those uh, a little bit later. Uh, in the Texas Medical Center, we're doing about what we've done before. The R number is 0.87. We'd like it to be 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 0 0.4. It's staying at that 0.87 level. Just as the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation predicted. Uh, unfortunately, we're just going to continue to trickle down very, very slowly, and I don't think we'll get down to where we want to be as fast as I'd like it to be. Our test positivity rate keeps falling. It's down to 2.8%. And the number of new cases on a seven day rolling average is also down below 300. It's actually down to 279. But that's 279 cases. So that's still a lot of virus in the community and 55 people are being hospitalized each day. 
Well, that's way better than 400. But still, 55 people a day being hospitalized, 279 new cases a day. That's a lot of virus in the community. So I don't feel like we're where we can just pretend it doesn't exist. We're not, we're not there yet. Hopefully we'll get there. And of course, what's the news on the Olympics? <laughs> it's so bad. I, it's just so bad, I don't know what to say. 3% uh, of the population of Japan has been vaccinated. They're re racing, they're racing. They the military, everybody's trying to vaccinate people. They think if they're really focused on it, they'll have 10% of the population vaccinated by July 23rd, when the Olympics start. 10% of the population vaccinated. So you're trying to figure out what's gonna happen. Well, I can guarantee one thing, there's gonna be an Olympic record. It's gonna be an infections. <laughs> it's gonna, they're gonna set a record for super spreader events. There's just no way that that's gonna work out well with, I mean, I, whatever. Let's keep our athletes safe and pray for them because it's not gonna be good going over there. So I wanted to talk about real breakthroughs in, in, in this particular uh, study of viruses. We're coming from the organoid center of the earth for a reason. Uh, it's really important to be able to isolate these viruses and culture them so you can identify what cells they infect, how they get into cells, how you can treat them. It's really, really important. It's very, very hard for viruses uh, to grow in, in human cells uh, in culture. And we used to do this all the time. We put cells on plastic. Well, cells need to have an up and a down, an apical and base lateral surface. They're polarized. They function with polarization. And if they're grown on plastic, they just form like little flat pancakes and they don't really serve as a very good vehicle for infection. And so we did other things like putting matrix down, different kinds of uh, like collagen uh, to try and get them to become more columnar, uh, especially epithelial cells. And that works to a certain extent. Then uh, a woman named Hinda Kleinman developed a matrigel, which was a, a combination of collagen and laminin and fibronectin and a bunch of growth factors. And that did even, even better. So now we were getting to the point where cells are beginning to behave more like they would in the human body. Well, the next step was to try and get them to be three-dimensional. And a, a very outstanding scientist, uh, Dr. Cleavers from the Netherlands, was the first to report being able to grow these cells in 3D. They're called organoids. And the reason it's really important here is that Mary Estes, our own Mary Estes here in the Department of Virology, was studying noroviruses. Now, noroviruses are those viruses that cause real severe gastrointestinal problems are rampant on cruise ships, which is why I will never go on a cruise ship. But she was trying to grow these in, in culture and it was very difficult. And she read this paper by Cleavers et al. in 2011 and started growing epithelial uh, organoid cultures from the gut. And that allowed her to uh, isolate norovirus and culture it uh, and begin to uh, explore how to treat it. Well, Dr. Estes, what a pleasure it is to see you today back from your vacation. Thank you, it's nice to be here to talk to you. So I'm really fascinated by this whole organoid thing because uh, I've been reading all these papers about how to grow uh, coronavirus and other viruses. So tell me about how you first got involved with this, particularly around the norovirus. So we started about 10 years ago, uh, trying to, what, we've actually been trying to grow the virus uh, for about 20 years and other people were trying to grow it for almost mm -hmm. 50 years. And we read, uh, we tried many set classical cultures that the virus wouldn't grow in. And then I like to read broadly, and I read about uh, Hans Cleaver's breakthrough. From the Netherlands. That, from the Netherlands, right. And he could isolate stem cells from intestinal tissue uh, and grow them into these human mini guts or human intestinal avatars, or many words, you use things, organoid cultures. And these are non transformed. Uh, and they represent really the person they come from. We're trying to put now other cells in with them. Uh, so we're putting in immune cells. Uh, we're just starting to try to put some nerves in as well. Uh, and we do hope to make intestine in, in the future. That so what's the, what are the things you can do in the organoid system that you can't do in regular culture? I mean, clearly you can grow the virus where you couldn't before. Are there other things you can do? So we, first of all, we, with not only our virus, but other people now using these for viruses, you find out what cell type does the virus actually grow in. Mm -hmm. uh, so for norovirus, it grows both in enterocytes and in enteroendocrine cells. And only and on cruise ships, apparently. 
<laughs> it's a big problem on cruise ships, yes. And it's the screen for therapeutics? Yes, we're, tr we're doing that now. Uh, we have a collaboration with Dr. Prashad and Dr. Paulskill and Dr. Song here at Baylor. And we're trying to develop antivirals for norovirus. Other people are doing that with coronavirus. Uh, one of the things that uh, actually Hans Cleaver said was that if people had tested remdesivir in these cultures, they would have known that it, it didn't work to, Very well. uh, yeah. to inhibit the virus. Now we also can do that in this lab in, with lung tissue, with brain tissue, with lung, uh, with lung tissue that can grow flu and SARS. And so this is really, really an important breakthrough. Now last year, uh, in, in Science had a paper from Cleaver's group in the Netherlands to try and isolate SARS virus and see whether or not it could grow either in lung or GI tissue. Uh, if you recall with, with, with SARS, one of, the, one of the early complaints, we know it's a respiratory virus, but one of the early symptoms are GI. People get abdominal pain, often vomiting, diarrhea, it's a real problem. And so the, the question was, do they actually grow in GI cells? So he cultured virus in two dimension in airway cultures and, and grew these in plastic dishes and able to get virus in those kinds of cells, but that didn't answer the question, so he created these organoids that are really three-dimensional, and he was able to infect, you can see the white uh, viruses, able to infect these cells in, in tissue culture, very much like what happens in humans. So that was a real breakthrough, and you could even identify the viruses coming out of the surfaces of those cells. And, and the Science uh, the magazine had this really great picture of a three-dimensional GI organoid infected by SARS-CoV-2. Now, why, why is it really important to have uh, assays that can really, you know, faithfully replicate what goes on in, in real people in vivo? Well, remember chloroquine. Well, chloroquine was used in tissue culture uh, using uh, a vera cells that are African green monkey cells that have been passed in culture for 60 years. They're actually closer to a cancer cell than they are a real normal gut cell. And they were able to block uh, viral entry with chloroquine using that cell system. Unfortunately, it doesn't work at all in people, which we discovered. Well, one of the things is it does not work in organoid culture. So organoids are much better at being more like human than they are in other forms of tissue culture. And when you look at what are the immune responses when the, the host has when they, once the cell gets infected, they did a transcriptomic analysis, which is basically looking at all the transcripts that are generated, and it's mostly an inflammatory, intense inflammatory response. Well, we know the problem that uh, people have when they do poorly with SARS is that they have an intense inflammatory response. So all of a sudden now we have a way to look at it in, vivo, in, in vitro, in cell culture, and find ways to mitigate that response. So it's really, really exciting. Uh, also being able to do the same thing in lung tissue is really important. And so this laboratory is the, making some real advances in the ability to grow uh, human pathogenic viruses and figure out ways uh, to understand how the host responds, how we can treat it, and uh, what's the genetic predisposition to getting sick or having certain responses. So really exciting news, great science this week from a wonderful laboratory, lots of advances, classic Baylor kind of College of Medicine core laboratory support. We're really, really excited. So the only thing I wanted to finish with was guess, guess where the one hot spot is in, in Texas? Dimmick County. You know, I just, I finally given, I, I, I spoke with Lily and I said, you know, what, what are we gonna do? So Lily has told me, you know, she, she thought about it and she has decided the way out of this is she has declared her candidacy for the Dimmick County Commissioner. Uh, she thinks if she's the Dimmick County judge, she will be able to influence change and unfortunately, she has uh, one opponent, Bob de Havilena, but we're very excited about her candidacy, so we look forward to seeing how she does. But I want you all to go out there and support Lily for county judge. Anyway, have a great weekend, weekend and I will see you next week. <laughs> if you look at Texas, we, we have a few hot spots. Guess which, guess which county's the hot spot? Our friends in Timmet County, they just can't get their acts together. Those javelinas, I don't know what they're doing down there, but they got to stop it. You stop it.
Hey, get out of here. Get out of here. Get, get.